So as you can see here, cultural diplomacy and war, the case of the Vietnam War. I think what's fascinating about this, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we don't have so much research in terms of also what cultural diplomacy can do or can't do in terms of conflict situations, whether that's pre-conflict, post-conflict, or during conflict. Uh, that's why I'm really very happy that you agreed to come to Berlin uh, to give this lecture. And I think we can really learn in a number of ways, in particular this complex period of the, of the Vietnam uh, situation, where cultural diplomacy maybe is or is not appropriate. So I'd ask you to please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Professor Bert Boykenhorst. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for having me here. Uh, it's a, a, a great pleasure and a great honor to be here in this uh, wonderful lineup. Uh, I find myself here uh, as a historian to, to give you <coughs> a historian's perspective on cultural diplomacy. And uh, yesterday we had a round of uh, very interesting talks and discussions and uh, some of the definitions on cultural diplomacy uh, we, we talked about. Um, but actually, from a historical uh, perspective, cultural diplomacy has meant different things in different times, obviously. Uh, what I will do today is uh, talk a bit about uh, the Vietnam War, which is uh, my historical specialty, and its legacy, <coughs> and how uh, cultural diplomacy has been used before, during, and after that war. Uh, and we will touch on some of the topics that were also addressed uh, a little bit yesterday, I think. Um, <coughs> okay. So uh, uh, what we will do is look a little bit about definitions. I'm not going to give you definitions, but I just want to, to uh, uh, let you think a little bit about uh, these different perspectives and also the historical context of some of these definitions. So we can talk about cultural diplomacy, but also public diplomacy, or sometimes the new public diplomacy is being used as a term. Cultural exchange, sort of a two-way movement, has been discussed yesterday as well. Or maybe the evil word propaganda. I mean, that is also is something that we need to consider within this context. Another question, sort of a sub-question that we can touch upon is the relationship between the production of information for a domestic audience or a foreign audience. Is there a difference or not? And at the end of the talk, I will come back to this as well. And also the role of state and non-state actors. Okay, before the Vietnam War, if we look at the American case, because that is what I'm focusing on now, uh, we see that in the United States, uh, what Tom Engelhardt, a historian, has described is a victory culture. So really, the sentiment that the America, uh, the United States, is really on a high uh, economic-wise, cultural-wise, uh, and it's producing also cultural products that are emphasizing that victory culture. You can see it in a lot of, for instance, the uh, United States Information Agency project, uh, pro, uh, uh, publications and products that are being sent out to the world to show uh, what the United States was all about. And this was a message of victory. Uh, very positive, optimistic. Uh, winner of two world wars, the, the champion of freedom. Uh, uh, you, you, you know uh, uh, the drill. Um, also the Marshall Plan, for instance, was one of those exponents. Yet underneath that victory culture, there was also at the same time the creation of what you could call a, a, a culture of fear. Uh, a fear for the other, a creation of the fear for the other, for the communist other. And also here, cultural publications and productions played a role in sort of presenting that fear to an audience, both at home and abroad. I just want to give you one example here of uh, Walt Disney. This is actually a cartoon that predates the Cold War, also emphasizing the fact that this culture of fear has a longer tradition in the United States. Think about maybe as you know, uh, uh, Richard Hofstadter's The Paranoid Style in American Politics, one of the classics uh, that is emphasizing this longer tradition. This is Walt Disney uh, 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 telling you a story about Pluto, and Pluto is being tried by, by cats, uh, the other. We have the dogs and we have the cats, so they are complete opposites. And it's an unfair trial, so he is already guilty before anything has happened. You see the jury is full of cats and they have their boards up already. This is an example of how children are actually exposed to a message of fear, fear the other, fear the communist, um, which is not per se a, a product of propaganda, I would say, because it was not the state who told Walt Disney make this movie or make this cartoon. It was actually the result of uh, the private initiative of Walt Disney, who had very strong anti-communist sentiments. He used his own organization, his own company, to produce a message like this which was obviously welcomed also by the United States government. So there we have non-state and state actors sort of working together. And Walt Disney was also uh, uh, later on 
uh, working for uh, the government in producing similar type of, uh, of cartoons. Uh, you can watch it all on YouTube. If you are a child, it's a terrifying message. It's one of the worst <laughs> or frightening uh, uh, Walt Disney cartoons. Um, over the course of the Cold War, that fear strengthened, of course, and sometimes for good reasons. We have the nuclear uh, standoff. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at some of those cultural productions at the time, it is really a terrifying time because the world could literally explode, of course, every minute. Um, if we walk, or if we go towards the, the Vietnam War, leading up to the Vietnam War, we see that actually, in a tiny, tiny nutshell, the Vietnam War could be explained as a combination of both that victory culture on the one hand and the culture of fear on the other. The culture of fear can be seen in what is known as the domino theory. So communism had to be stopped in South Vietnam or else all the other countries would fall to communism one by one, eventually leading up to a threat to the national security in the United States. So there is this element of fear. On the other hand, there's very strongly this element of uh, uh, the victory culture. Because it was not the United States was not only in Vietnam to stop communism, it was also there to build nations. So to create a nation uh, with democracy, with market capitalism, in the positive image of the United States as well. And think of the rhetoric that was uh, uh, put forward by uh, John F. Kennedy, very inspiring words <coughs> about uh, 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 being able to overcome all the, uh, uh, co overcome all the troubles and uh, uh, bear any burden to defend freedom and liberty around the world. And there were also advocates of what was then very popular, modernization theory, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, the idea that the United States could build nations in its image. Um, a combination of fear and a combination of the victory culture. Um, Needless to say, uh, uh, the Vietnam War uh, did not go as planned. It was not uh, the optimistic endeavor uh, that was, uh, it was supposed to be. Uh, nevertheless, there were some cultural productions <coughs> uh, in part by the United States Information Agency, but these are examples <coughs> of uh, also this combination of state actors and non-state actors who are putting forward a certain message that is favorable for the United States, presenting it to audience both at home and abroad. I don't know if you know the, the, the film Green Berets by John Wayne. It is a depiction of the conflict in Vietnam. Uh, the movie came out in 1968. And if you watch it, and if you know a little bit about the Vietnam War, it's an extreme simplification of that war. It's sort of telling the story of cowboys and Indians and then putting it in the context of the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the song next to it is the Ballad of the Green Berets that hit the, the number one, one charts in the United States. Uh, in the crucial year of 1968, mind you. So that is often seen as the year where public support for the Vietnam War get, uh, went down the drain. Yet on the other hand, also this positive uplifting message was also embraced by the American public. The film was criticized highly, by the way. But, uh, uh, also here, John Wayne, on his own initiative, wanted to tell a different story about Vietnam. So here we see, just like with Walt Disney, he took up the initiative, he made the movie also with the help of the Defense Department and funding, and then uh, uh, putting out that message. Um, the United States Information Agency, which is often seen as the historical component of cultural diplomacy in the United States, uh, very active during the Cold War, emphasized during the Vietnam War mainly three messages. They were always very optimistic, just in line with the, the official government message. They emphasized the progress of the war. It was always going good, victory was just around the corner, and there was light at the end of the tunnel. This was sort of the repetitive message that was continued. They also presented South Vietnam as a democratic state that was uh, sort of, well, uh, 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 should get American support, notwithstanding the fact that actually the regime of Nodin Jem was, was notoriously corrupt and autocratic. So there was this contrast also. On the one hand, you had the message of the United States Information Agency and the government, which was very optimistic. On the other hand, increasingly more critical uh, messages came forward uh, by the rest of the media. And also, the USIA defended the invasion and the bombing of Cambodia in 1970, uh, which again was one of those huge contrasts, because 
the invasion occurred just after President Nixon was elected, and President Nixon was elected on a message of peace. He was going to end the war in Vietnam, and the first thing he does is expanding the war to Cambodia. So here again we have these contrasting images. And uh, uh, the, the invasion of Cambodia spurred uh, a, a reinvigorated anti-war movement throughout the world. Also here in Berlin, uh, I recall reading that uh, before the America House here, protest in 1970, uh, uh, more than 200 people got injured in violent protest because of these events. So there is this huge clash of messages, messages th that are not eagerly or welcomely accepted as they were before the Vietnam War. So there is this legacy, and uh, uh, one of the main legacies of the Vietnam War is actually this, this what is called the credibility gap. Information is not automatically accepted anymore, and especially information that is given out by official uh, 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 institutions like the government or like the USIA. So uh, there was one um, element, the credibility gap. But the, the, the Vietnam War really uh, divided America in a lot of other ways as well. It, it divided also the ideology, so sort of the, that victory culture was really tarnished, the notion that America was always a force of good, was always a force to be welcomed. People started to doubt it, and really you saw a split or maybe even a fragmentation in the ideological landscape, which also affected notions of American identity. In terms of cultural diplomacy, or in terms of what kind of message one does the United States wants to present to the rest of the world, this caused a problem, because before Vietnam, the message was fairly easy. After Vietnam, it was much more difficult. These notions of being the champion of freedom were met with intense criticism and, and, and cynicism even at times, while other people in the world, particularly uh, behind the Iron Curtain, were still very much suffering under the, the, the pressures of communism, and they uh, uh, did have their hopes still set on, uh, uh, on the United States. Um, also, for instance, take into account uh, elements like the Watergate scandal, and there were scandals in the intelligence community really tarnishing the credibility of the United States as a superpower. Um, so how did post-Vietnam presidents deal with that difficult message to address? Well, um, uh, uh, the first president after Vietnam, President Ford, who came in by accident, more or less, um, uh, uh, he uh, took up the bicentennial in 1976 as a message to project a more positive image of the United States to the rest of the world. Uh, the bicentennial, so 200 years after the, uh, the, the revolution, um, really gave him an opportunity to emphasize uh, through uh, all kinds of festivities around the country, uh, also inviting international audiences, emphasizing again the founding principles and the founding elements of the United States, really giving this well, positive, positive, optimistic uh, outlook. Um, if we go to Carter, President Carter, his successor, what he did was sort of, he did away with hard power, more or less, in international relations, emphasized on soft power. And he emphasized mostly human rights issues. So this was really the leading element in his foreign policy. And he used also cultural diplomacy to do so. Most importantly, what Carter, here we have him, uh, uh, did was he changed the outlook uh, and the message of the United States Information Agency. So the agency that was mostly active in uh, cultural diplomacy. He changed the name into United States International Communication Agency. Very important. It stopped its communist pro programming, it stopped its covert uh, propaganda campaigns, uh, but emphasizing the international aspect of it, what he did was he added a two-way mandate. First, the USIA was just presenting America to the world. Now, the, uh, the, the agency should also present the world to America. So talking more about this cultural exchange that we have been discussing, for instance, uh, uh, yesterday in, in, in a lot of panels. So cultural diplomacy has an exchange, where first it was just an outward projection. Um, so Reagan, uh, uh, Carter wanted to foster more cultural awareness, also because the lesson was that uh, it had been difficult to, uh, to create this cultural awareness. 
What he said about the Vietnam War was basically we were taught that our armies were always invincible and our causes were always just, only to suffer the agony of Vietnam. He said this in a speech in 1979. And what he said with this was basically there is no more victory culture. So he does away with victory culture in a way. What he also said, we are now free of that inordinate fear of communism. So he also did away with this culture of fear. So both the victory culture and the culture of fear were put away. But what he did was basically creating an ideological vacuum, because if there's no cultural fear and there's no uh, uh, culture of victory, well, what is then American identity or what's the message that they needed to project outwards? That vacuum was picked up by Reagan and was filled in by conservatives who were very much concerned about the communist threat in the world. And um, what Reagan did was he restored the uh, message of the USIA, again, presenting the world to the, uh, pres I'm sorry, <laughs> presenting America to the rest of the world is one way message. But also he created, and here is where the definitions become problematic, the Office of Public Diplomacy for Latin American and Caribbean um, which was in name public diplomacy, but actually it was an agency of propaganda, full, filled with CIA staffers, psychological operations specialists, etc. Uh, um, actually recreating this culture of fear in relation to, in this case, mostly Central American policies. Think of Nicaragua, think of El Salvador, Honduras, where Reagan saw a communist threat. So, um, just to come back to my definitions, these are some of the terms that can be used or has been used in different ways in different uh, contexts, cultural diplomacy, but also public diplomacy. If I think about the office of public diplomacy, I'm thinking of propaganda. But when we are talking about public diplomacy yesterday, these are completely different notions. I think it's important to be aware of that historical context. Um, also, there is this relation, of course, between domestic and foreign audiences, where to who is the message uh, uh, geared at. To conclude, basically what I wanted to say is that cultural diplomacy is not always or has not always been geared at fostering mutual understanding, but also at exciting these fears. We saw it with Pluto, we saw it with the Office of the Public Diplomacy, but also at the same time, Carter sort of well, set up already this intercultural exchange program, at least the idea. Um, in the ideal world, cultural diplomacy should foster mutual understanding and interaction, taking away the foundations of fear. That would be the ideal. Yet, uh, the politics of fear are still something, uh, still a tool that has been widely used, and maybe increasingly so. So, that ideal cannot be taken for granted. That is basically what I want to give you today. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent uh, lecture, and I really appreciate it. I think it fit in excellently in terms of the cultural diplomacy and also the conflict situation. I see you've inspired already one question in the back or a comment. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll make it short. Mr. B Birkenhorst, did I say that right? It is Birkenhorst, yes. Birkenhorst. Yeah. Uh, you know, you didn't know when you came here that you would confront a Vietnam veteran. I, I, I was warned. You were warned. <laughs> Mark, did you warn him? I, I don't, <laughs> Not by Mark. Yeah. Okay, so uh, on the question of cultural diplomacy, which is the underlying theme here uh, in this conference, I think a couple of things have been uh, ignored or skirted. Because in, in the case of, v of Vietnam, or any, of, any war, if you think of it, uh, the soldiers play a part in cultural diplomacy in, in one way or another. If they marry the, uh, the women of that particular area, um, whatever, they bring that culture. There is a cultural exchange. And just a couple of historical notes. And I'm a firm believer, you don't have to go to the moon to know it's there. So you can ha be an expert on this subject without having, been, having to be a Vietnam veteran. And conversely, I don't have to know anything about Vietnam having been there. So uh, I don't want to try to overwhelm, overwhelm, overwhelm you with my experience. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things in terms of cultural diplomacy. Music, for instance, and black music. Uh, James Brown had, uh, during the Vietnam War, he had a song called I'm Black and I'm Proud. Frida Payne had a song called Bring the Boys Home. And the Shirelles had a song called Soldier Boy. 
these songs were put on the blacklist and couldn't be played uh, by AFN in Vietnam for a number of reasons. The Vietnam War took place, you know, in the context of tremendous uh, social upheaval, not only in the United States, but around the world. The women's movement, the civil rights movement, black liberation struggle, the f fight for independence internationally uh, uh, against the uh, colonial powers, the European colonial powers. So all of that had an effect on how people saw the war, and especially the soldiers in the context of the armed conflict in Vietnam. Uh, I can vividly remember going to uh, the, the clubs in Vietnam and being astounded how much the Vietnamese knew about our culture and how much they knew about our music and how they, could, they couldn't speak English but they could sing the songs. That just blew me away. So uh, it's important to remember in this conversation, and, and it's always absent, and I, I'm not saying, I'm not implying that you said it was absent, but generally speaking, that we played a role that we interacted with these people in whatever war that is. And it's a very important aspect that should not be ignored. On the subject of uh, John Wayne, John Wayne uh, made a career starting in the uh, Second World War making films for the United States government. So he, he was getting this support from the United States government from the very beginning. And in fact, in Vietnam, we had a saying, you know, don't come here with this jet with that John Wayne shit, you know, because that meant that that what he was doing was, you know, on the silver screen, but reality was something else. Uh, the question of uh, the legacy of, of Vietnam. Uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran, as I said, and I'm a member of the of Vietnam Veterans Against the War, anti-imperialist, the Stop the War Brigade, and I'm also in a movie it's called Sir No Sir, which documents the resistance inside the United States military during the Vietnam War. So also, also, uh, I'm going to make this very brief, also um, soldiers inside, inside the United States military were, they, they themselves rising up and protesting the war, and in the end, and in the end, the war could not be conducted uh, by, by the combination of the people out in the streets all over the world, in America and other countries, protesting the war, and soldiers themselves saying no. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, but I think your remark on the soldiers and the soldiers as cultural exchange is extremely important. I mean, if you look at the stories of, of veterans that, that you just gave us, but also uh, uh, other stories where people go back to Vietnam, talk with former North Vietnamese people that they were fighting against, now bringing together some sort of cultural reconciliation, these are very powerful stories and really a, a great addition, just like uh, uh, the music, as you said. Um, I do would like to know that, that uh, um, uh, even though the, the Vietnamese were, remar you, you remarked that the Vietnamese were very much aware of American music, I was wondering also how much Americans were aware of Vietnamese traditional music. I mean, there's, was there really an exchange going on, or was there more something in adaption or, or uh, the presenting, presentation of... Uh, of I must admit I know very little, because generally speaking, uh, you had very little time, you know, uh, to interact with the Vietnamese on that level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, when, when you saw the Vietnamese, you saw them in, in your particular context, in the clubs, or perhaps in the villages, but it's not like in America where there's a radio in every room and a television, you know what I mean? So you'd have to be part of a cultural event to be able to experience that. Sorry yeah. to say that. But we knew, they knew more about us than we knew about them, mm -hmm. to, just to capsulize that. Just one note on John Wayne. It is remarkable how many Vietnam veterans before uh, testify later on that before they went to Vietnam, they literally had no idea what they were going to. They had no idea where it was, what the conflict was all about. 
but they do testify to the fact that they visualize their experience or their coming experience in terms of John Wayne movies. So even if indeed, as you pointed out, John Wayne is in a way an agent of the government or an, an extension of the government, he also was someone who went for himself to the government and said, I have a plan, especially well, with the fact of the Green Berets, he said, I want to make this movie. And then it was facilitated. So it was sort of a, a, a two-way uh, uh, continuation. Okay. But thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Berndt Boykenhorst. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.